Good afternoon, friends. Welcome to Hugh Ross's Paradoxes class. It's good to see you. It's good to see the people in the audience. It's nice to see the people that I can't see in the, the uh, YouTube world, but welcome to you as well. Uh, today, Hugh Ross is going to be giving us a presentation on his own and, and giving us a, a brief update on something that happened over the weekend that we'd like to share with you. Um, for the people who are here, I'd ask you to please check your cell phones and make sure that they're set on quiet so they don't interrupt the flow. And for the people who are here also who have not been here before, off to my left, through this room, you'll see a sign that will lead you to the restrooms. And please enjoy the goodies. Uh, thank you, Hugh Ross brought some too. I appreciate you bringing some. And Daniel Cuevas, thank you so much for going over there to, to the pizza place and uh, the Durham's for supplying <laughs> part of the finances for that. Thank you very much. We appreciate all of you. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Hugh Ross. Please take over. It's all yours, sir. Well, we got a little different setup here at the Reasons to Believe. You see the couches and everything. And that's because on Friday and uh, yesterday, uh, we were having our third workshop. Every year, Reasons to Believe sponsors a workshop. The first one was on human origins. Uh, the second one was on artificial intelligence. And the third one that took place this past weekend was on dual revelation, biblical inerrancy, and scientific concordism. And that's kind of the working title of a book that I just finished. And so we invited uh, theologians from across the country uh, to come here. And uh, they all had the manuscript in advance. And so they were here to critique, evaluate, and uh, give us some uh, counsel here at Reasons to Believe and how we can move forward. And uh, you know, a lot of this I've already presented in the Paradoxes class. I mean, that's kind of my... Uh, way I take advantage of the paradoxes is I get to try out uh, new research material that we're developing here at Reasons to Believe. And so it was over a course of about nine months, I presented about half of the content that goes in the new book that's out. But I think what encouraged me is like, you know, the workshop is where you invite people who are experts in the discipline to kind of critique the model that we develop here at Reasons to Believe. And uh, I can share this with you. We had four of the people who were the theologians and scientists here uh, basically review my book. It was the most thorough review of a book I've ever done, most thorough peer review, the most valuable. Uh, it, I told all four of them it's the best review I've ever received in my book. Uh, I got a little bit of a, a problem with the editorial team because it said, the book is already on the long side, and all of the reviewers wanted more content in the book. Uh, but I just found a way to take what they were giving me and to try to compactify it. And so I think I can still keep the editors here at Reasons to Believe Happy. Uh, the book is now sitting at about 88,000 words. They're telling me, well, as long as we can keep it under 90, uh, we're okay with that. And of course, uh, being scholars, uh, most of the content that they wanted was more endnotes. So uh, the endnotes are now a little more extensive than they used to be. And, uh, you know, Mark uh, was here with us uh, all through Friday and Saturday. So I'm going to actually have him augment my report. But from my perspective, I was kind of, you know, uh, on the hot seat because we had uh, in our first workshop on human origins, you know, Fuzz is our primary researcher on that topic. We put them on the hot seat for two days. Artificial intelligence, Jeff Zwierink is our resident expert on that. We put him on the hot seat. I was on the hot seat this past weekend as the theologians uh, were evaluating and critiquing. But at least from my perspective, Mark, it didn't feel like the seat was that hot. Uh, the responses were quite friendly. And as I talked to each of them individually, they all told me they really loved the manuscript. And I told them some of the additions that were going in. They said, we really like those additions. And they also told me that if they think of anything else that they think needs to go in the book, uh, they'll let me know. But uh, yeah, I think I had the coolest seat of the three of us that uh, uh, went through this workshop experience. And a lot of credit goes to my colleague, Ken Samples. 
because I told Ken, look, uh, you give me a very tight deadline to finish the draft of this book because the whole idea is we're going to get it out at least a month in advance of the workshop so they could all read and study it and prepare to uh, uh, get their different presentations on it. And so I said, the only way I can finish it with that tight of a deadline is if you will organize the workshop. And he did. Uh, so he deserves a lot of credit for getting all the invitations out. Uh, and of course, our events team also pulled in and it made everything happen. And again, I don't know about you, Mark, I thought the events team made a spectacular presentation here. The food, the drink, they just took care of everything for us. Uh, the technical <coughs> things all worked out uh, really well. So, uh, and everything got recorded. And I'm basically sharing with all of you is that if you haven't seen the Human Origins Workshop, just go to the reasons.org website and you put in 2020 Human Origins Workshop, it'll pop up and you can see all the video recordings, both of Fuzz's presentation and then the different scientists and theologians that were presented, all of that's recorded. We did the same thing for the artificial intelligence. Uh, you're not going to see the recording tomorrow because our media team is going to try to clean up and uh, pretty up. They're not going to take anything out. There will be no abridgment of the content, uh, but they do want to uh, do their best uh, to make it a little slicker. And also, they want to send it out to all the presenters first, make sure they approve before we make it available to the public. Say, so when will it be available to the public? Probably within a month. Uh, but don't hold me to that. It all depends on our media team uh, getting all of their work done. But yeah, you'll be able to uh, see that's also true of uh, our virtual audience, our YouTube audience. Uh, we'll be making it available uh, online for free so that uh, people can uh, take advantage of that. And people have ask me, well, when's the, your book going to be available? Well, the good news is that uh, my book, uh, Designed to the Core, it's actually here on site at Reasons to Believe. And uh, if you're a monthly partner of Reasons to Believe, uh, your book will be in the mail uh, this week. We're sending it out to all of our monthly partners. And I think within a week or two, uh, we're going to be able to make the book available to anyone who makes a donation of any amount uh, to Reasons to Believe. And as far as the public release where you can get it through Amazon and all the other dot coms, uh, that will probably be happening uh, late August, no later uh, than September 1st. But yeah, people are part of our constituents. Uh, you'll get the first grab at that. Uh, as far as the book on dual revelation, uh, that will probably be available a year to a year and a half from now. So, but it is in the editorial team. Uh, they're working on it. Uh, uh, right now. Okay, uh, last week uh, you got to hear from Ken Samples. Uh, he is scheduled to do a two-week series on the best evidences for the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Uh, he'll be doing part two of that two-part series on July 17th. Uh, July 17th, my wife and I will be doing one of our uh, mountaineering vacations, so we're not going to be there. Uh, but Ken uh, will be giving part two. What I'm going to be giving today is uh, part two of a series. I actually gave you part one uh, two weeks ago, uh, three weeks ago. Uh, and then today I hope to finish that up. And it's a talk on the origin of the elements for salvation. When you look at the periodic table, I don't think you probably got this when you were taking junior high chemistry, you know, they kind of roll out the periodic table. I don't think they actually told you uh, in your, probably not even, even if you went to a Christian school, I'll bet you they didn't tell you that the periodic table you see is exactly the periodic table you need for billions of human beings to be redeemed by the creator of the universe. But that's kind of what I want to present. And uh, again, we'll be making it available on YouTube uh, through our YouTube channel. If you're not already a subscriber to the Reasons to Believe YouTube channel, you can subscribe for free and you can sign up to be notified of the latest video releases. And again, every scholar here at Reasons to Believe takes questions on Facebook and Twitter. 
Uh, most of the time today will be devoted to Q&A, uh, but if you always think of a question after the event is over, uh, again, you're welcome to post a question on either my Facebook or uh, my Twitter page. Well, since it's been uh, well, well, three Sundays ago uh, that I did part one of this series, I'm going to kind of give you a review, but I'm going to go through it really fast, and then where we end, and incidentally, it's already posted at paradoxes.org, so if you want to watch or listen to uh, part one, uh, that's where you'll be able to find it. You can download it for free in audio format uh, or full uh, video. Uh, but a lot of the periodic table fine-tuning you'll find in this book, reasons.org, uh, uh, The Creator and the Cosmos. Anyone can get a free chapter of the book at reasons.org slash Ross. And uh, yes, this book is now in our warehouse designed to the core. And uh, you know, next week I'm actually going to launch a series on design to the core. Uh, it was about uh, 10 days ago I gave a very brief course summarizing the content of this book of Biola University. Uh, I did it in uh, one day, uh, and it was to an audience of engineers and scientists. Uh, but what was really encouraging for me is two engineers came up to me and said that they had read, one of them had read The Fingerprint of God and told me it had brought them to faith in, faith in Christ. And the second one said, reading the Creator and the Cosmos uh, was the turning point in their giving their life to Christ. And uh, after I finish uh, my uh, short course there at Biola, uh, as I was leaving, a gentleman came up to me and said, just wanted to share with you, he's about 50 years of age. He said, taking this course today was the most exciting day of my life. And he was the one that encouraged me, you've got to package this. Uh, for a lay audience. So I'm going to do an experiment starting next week of uh, trying to take that uh, course I taught at Biola and repackaging it and uh, getting it recorded. And here again, I really count on all of you that are here in person and those of you that are with us uh, through YouTube Live. Uh, please feed back. Uh, I really count on this class as a way to kind of evaluate, fine-tune, and revise uh, because of some time in the future, uh, I'd like to get this recorded. In fact, I'll probably be doing that when I go to Regent University in the fall. Uh, but you're going to be the first to see uh, this content and again, appreciate your feedback. But let me finish up uh, what we got started three weeks ago. Uh, the creation of the elements for life and the elements I'm referring to are the 92 elements we see in the periodic table. And again, I'm gonna just blast through this quickly because it's already recorded. It's just a quick review. We began by saying, why do we need such a large universe to get the periodic table? And basically made the point, if it wasn't for the universe being precisely the mass that it is, containing two trillion galaxies. This is at a date I need to update it. Uh, we now know there's two trillion galaxies in the universe, not just 200 billion, uh, where each one contains 100 to 300 billion stars. Uh, but we need the universe to be precisely uh, the mass that it is, because if it isn't, the only element you get is the element hydrogen. And you're not gonna get life if all you got is hydrogen. We need the other elements. And so the universe's mass determines what elements you get, and the greater the cosmic mass density, the more hydrogen gets fused into helium. But if you make the universe with inadequate mass, with a little bit less uh, than those two trillion uh, galaxies, then the only elements you're gonna get is nothing but hydrogen, or you might get hydrogen and a small amount of helium, but future stars would be unable to take that mixture of hydrogen and helium and uh, make the heavier elements. On the other hand, make the universe slightly more massive, and this is what the periodic table looks like. You get iron and all the elements heavier than iron, but none of the elements lighter than iron. The problem is way too much hydrogen gets fused into helium in the first few minutes after the Big Bang creation event. 
So it takes an exquisitely fine-tuned mass of the universe to get the periodic table uh, that your chemistry professor or teacher unfurled in your uh, junior high uh, uh, you know, school class. Uh, but it's not as easy as that. In order to get something more than helium, and in particular uh, to get carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, the three most life-critical elements, in order to get anything beyond helium, it's crucial that the ground state energy levels of two helium atoms add up almost identically to the ground state energy level of beryllium. If that doesn't happen, you will not get past beryllium and you won't have the elements you need for life. Uh, but that's not all you need. You need the ground state energy levels of beryllium and helium to add up to the excited state energy level of carbon. And in order to get a universe where you've got roughly equal amounts of carbon and oxygen, it's necessary that the ground state energy levels of those two elements be roughly equal. And as you can see here, the ground state energy level for oxygen is slightly less than carbon. And uh, that's important because in order to get an abundance of life on planet Earth, uh, we need oxygen to be somewhat more abundant than carbon. And uh, I gave you this quote from Fred Hoyle. He was the one, along with uh, Willie Fowler and uh, the Burbages, Jeffrey and Mar Margaret Burbage, that actually worked out the nucleosynthesis equations that explain all the elements we see in the periodic table. And uh, it was Fred Hoyle that really discovered this incredible fine tuning in the ground state energy levels of helium, beryllium, carbon, and oxygen. And this is what he said. Now, uh, he's not a theist. He's not a Christian. Uh, but this is what he wrote in an engineering and science journal. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with the physics as well as with the chemistry and the biology, and there are no blind forces we're speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem so overwhelming as to put this conclusion uh, beyond question. And he wound up writing a number of books on the fine tuning of the universe, and in particular the fine tuning of elements we see in the periodic table. Now, you can get hydrogen and helium uh, from the Big Bang creation event. All that happens in the first four minutes after the cosmic creation event, but it's future stars that will take that precise mixture of hydrogen and helium, roughly 75% hydrogen and 25% helium, actually it's 76 and 24, and with that, with three successive generations of stars forming, burning, and dying, you eventually can flesh out all the elements we see here in the periodic table. That's one reason why, in order to get human beings in the universe, the universe has to be about 14 billion years old, because you won't get the chemicals, the elements we need for humans to exist and thrive until you go through three successive generations of stars. And where we ended up uh, three weeks ago is talking about how it's the merging of neutron stars that's responsible for about a quarter of the elements in the periodic table. And without those elements, basically it's half of the elements that are heavier than iron are almost entirely made when two neutron stars merge together to become a black hole. And you know, we're alive at that very time. It's only in the last few years uh, that astronomers have actually been able to build gravity wave telescopes. And it's these new gravity wave telescopes that for the first time have been able to observe two neutron stars. And the theory of general relativity tells us if you've got two neutron stars orbiting one another, their orbits will gradually uh, you know, shrink because what's happening with two neutron stars that over close to one another is that there's gravitational energy uh, being uh, absorbed and that causes the orbits to gradually spiral into one another as you see here in this diagram. 
and when they get really close together, you can see that the neutron stars themselves begin to be disturbed and to move towards a merger, and this is what things look like uh, right at that merger event where the two neutron stars merge together and they become a black hole. But when they merge together, basically the neutrons are being stripped off the two neutron stars and they're being jammed together at extremely high velocities and it's a dense stream of neutrons that actually causes iron, uh, you know, the element iron uh, to be built up into heavier elements. And hey, this is what the gravity wave telescope looks like. Uh, four kilometer long arms. This is the one in uh, Hanford, uh, Washington. This is what the inside looks like. And this is what uh, they actually get to see as the neutron stars spiral towards one another. And uh, you get, these are the gravitational waves you see. And if you look at the bottom, you see all at the point of merger, it all happens in two tenths of a second where they begin to very rapidly and then they merge together. And when they merge and become a black hole, uh, then the gravitational waves uh, dissipate. And this is another example of uh, how the gravitational energy in the waves begins to get bigger and bigger as it goes towards emerging a point and then it all disappears. So this is where we uh, picked up, uh, that's kind of everything that was covered uh, three weeks ago. And uh, the first thing uh, when they observe these neutron stars coming together to make a black hole, um, the black, you, you get to see both gravitational waves and light waves. You don't see this when black holes merge together. These gravity wave telescopes first detected two black holes merging together to become a bigger black hole. But black holes by definition are black. Uh, they're not emitting electromagnetic radiation. With neutron stars, uh, they're not black. And so as they move towards the merger, you get this a very bright emission of electromagnetic radiation across the electromagnetic spectrum. But this is the first time uh, that astronomers were able to measure the velocity of light and the velocity of the gravitational waves. Now, when I took physics, the presumption was the speed of gravity has to be the same as the speed of light. But I remember uh, when I was taking physics courses at the university, they were saying, well, well, we can measure the speed of light, but we're never gonna be able to measure the speed of gravity. The thinking back then was, it's simply beyond human technological capability to build an instrument that can measure the speed of gravity waves. Well, three such instruments exist in the world today. And uh, what they were able to determine was that the difference between the velocity of gravity waves and the velocity of light is less than three times 10 to the minus 15, which means they're able to prove that the velocity of light is the same as the velocity of gravity waves uh, to at least 14 places of the decimal. Now, uh, physicists and astronomers would love to be able to prove it to 20 places of the decimal uh, because that would eliminate a lot of theories that are being speculated uh, by theoretical physicists. And that's doable. I mean, this is the limit they got by looking at just one neutron star merging event. There are now five more gravity wave telescopes being built around the world. And uh, the one that made this discovery is, in the, is currently being upgraded to 10 times the sensitivity. So realistically, within the next five, no more than 10 years, uh, we're going to be able to detect about 100 neutron star merging events. And with that, they're going to be able to push us to several more places of the decimal. But what's gratifying is it actually affirms the particle creation model that is consistent with a cosmic creation model. And so, again, from the biblical perspective, that's what you'd expect and that's what we're seeing. And they said, well, they were able also to be able to put a limit on the mass of the graviton. I mean, what we notice in particle physics is that you've got the waves and you've got the particles uh, that are responsible for the waves. And they're able to put a limit 
on the mass of the graviton that is less than 3.14 times 10 to the minus 59 kilograms. And that's kind of hard to imagine, uh, but that's equivalent to 5 times 10 to the minus 31 uh, of the mass of the proton. So this ranks as by far the lowest limit that astronomers and physicists have ever been able to put on uh, the mass of a fundamental particle. But with a mass that low, less than 10 to the 30 times the mass of a proton, uh, it means we're never going to be able to uh, you know, create a graviton in a particle accelerator. Uh, even if you had a particle accelerator that extended from here to the most distant galaxy, it still wouldn't have uh, the power that you would need uh, to actually demonstrate the existence of a graviton. So uh, uh, I think that we're quite confident that we were saying we're never going to detect gravity waves. We have detected gravity waves, but I think we can confidently state we're never going to detect a graviton with a limit that low. Uh, it's simply inconceivable that we could come up with an instrument powerful enough to detect it. But again, this fits what we expect. Uh, so the particle creation models that are consistent uh, with the biblical cosmic creation model uh, would indeed predict that uh, the graviton would have that little mass. And also, they were able to demonstrate that the equivalence principle and Lorentz invariance were both affirmed to better than twice the previous best confirmation. And with more observations, they'll be able to get a confirmation down to 10 times better than we've been able to do before. But what that demonstrates is that the laws of physics are identical for all observers. And the laws of physics have not changed. And that's a biblical principle. Jeremiah 33 tells us uh, that the laws that govern the heavens and the earth are fixed. They haven't changed. And uh, we have in Romans chapter 8, uh, where it refers to the law of uh, decay. And it says this law of decay exists everywhere within the universe. So throughout the whole history of the universe and the entire geography of the universe, uh, it has uh, not uh, changed. And uh, Mark, I forgot to give you an opportunity to give a little report on your experience of what happened on Thursday and Friday. So uh, I can let you have that now or I can let you do that after I finish this uh, talk. After talk. After my talk, okay. Just wanted to, because I want Mark to have a, uh, an opportunity mm -hmm. too. He was in the audience. I was kind of up here. Yeah, you, you don't get the same uh, effect there. But yeah, this is a crucial uh, verification of what the Bible says about the laws of physics. Namely, that they don't change uh, anywhere within time or space in the universe. That means we can actually trust the book of nature. You know, yesterday we were talking about a God has given us two books, the book of nature and the book of scripture. It comes from the same God for whom it's impossible to lie and deceive. So both are trustworthy and reliable. But because the laws of physics have never changed and are they operate everywhere uh, within the universe, then that means that, yes, we can trust everything that we measure and observe uh, in the universe. And also, uh, they were able to determine that black hole mimickers uh, don't exist. And so uh, the black holes that we see all over the universe they're not exotic neutron or uh, neutrino stars or boson stars. They really are black holes. And again, uh, this affirms uh, what we would expect if indeed the particle creation model is 100% consistent with the cosmic creation model as uh, stated uh, in the Bible. But what happened when the first two neutron stars were beginning See, one of the things with these gravity wave telescopes, they can predict when the merger is going to take place. So they basically alerted astronomers all over the world. Hey, these are two neutron stars that are on the verge of merging together. We're not only going to get a gravitational signal, we're going to get a strong electromagnetic signal. And so they alerted people all over the world. And it literally involved 
uh, five, more than 5,000 astronomers all over the world, 80 different observatories. They were able to observe this merger event across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And that's where we were able to affirm that about 95% of the R process elements are made by neutron star mergering events. So if it wasn't for the density of neutron star mergers occurring in the universe, uh, we would have an inadequate supply of about one quarter of the elements you see in the periodic table. And so, and these are elements that can only be manufactured if you've got an extremely dense stream of very fast moving neutrons impacting uh, elements that are as heavy as iron or heavier, and that, that fills out uh, the periodic table. Now, what that implies for planet Earth is our solar system must have formed uh, during its formation stage relatively near to a neutron star merging event because we notice about these R process elements on planet Earth, they're super abundant, way more abundant than we see elsewhere in the universe, indicating we must have been blessed by having our solar system form adjacent to a neutron star merging event so that it could benefit uh, from all those manufactured R process <laughs> elements. On the other hand, uh, this is an incredibly energetic event. If you have your solar system forming too close to it, the merger event will destroy the solar system. Uh, but if it's not close enough, it won't get an adequate enrichment. Now, when I was uh, taking uh, astrophysics, the thinking was that it was supernova, uh, stars that go supernova that make the R process elements. Because with a supernova, you have this catastrophic collapse of the star uh, down to its core. There's a rebound, and with that rebound, there's a rush of neutrons. And so the thinking was uh, 30, 40 years ago, this is where all the R process elements come from. Uh, and I went to, um, when I was at Caltech, uh, I was a uh, uh, about two years ahead of a graduate student there, Robert Kirshner, he now ranks as the world's foremost expert in supernova, and he and his team at Harvard University, that's where he went after Caltech, uh, they were the ones that over several decades said, yes, the supernova do make these R process elements, <coughs> but at nowhere near the abundance that would be necessary to explain the quantity of these elements we see here on the planet Earth. And so the thinking today, now that we've seen the production of these elements going on in these neutron star merging events, is that the supernova make about 5%, uh, the neutron star merging events make 95%. But there's one outlier element that they couldn't explain. Neither the supernova nor the neutron star merging events could explain why our planet Earth is so abundant in molybdenum. How many of you have ever heard of molybdenum? Okay, almost all of you, good. Uh, probably where most people have heard of molybdenum. It's an element we use to make a high grade of stainless steel. Uh, but what you might not be aware of, you'd be dead if it wasn't for a significant quantity of molybdenum in your body. Uh, there are crucial proteins uh, that can't function without an adequate supply of molybdenum. So please make sure you're getting an adequate supply of molybdenum in your diet. Uh, there's food treats there on the table, and some of them are enriched uh, in uh, molybdenum. But what was discovered, and this, just, just, this discovery took place just six weeks ago, and uh, I've written a Today's New Reason to Believe article. I think it's already released. If not, it's going to be released in the next week or two. And it's a recognition that the molybdenum predominantly comes not from a supernova, not from neutron star merging events, but from a hypernova. Now, going back to the supernova, what you see here, the supernova is down there at the lower left. And for a period of about two months, a supernova will shine as brightly as 100 billion stars. So what you see here 
is that the supernova uh, compares in brightness with the brightness of its host galaxy. And that's the way it is uh, for a couple of months. Uh, but here's an image of a hypernova. A hypernova is about 100 times brighter than a supernova. Much rarer, I mean, uh, these are relatively rare events in the universe, but what you see here, it's not only as bright as its host galaxy, it's anywhere from tens to hundreds. The brightest are a thousand times brighter than its host galaxy. In this case, it's about a hundred times brighter than the host galaxy. But we now recognize, thanks to this paper was published about six weeks ago, this is where most of the universe's molybdenum uh, comes from. And therefore, astronomers have drawn the conclusion that in order to explain the periodic table of elements that we see and the abundances of these elements that are manifest in the crust of the Earth, it means that the solar system must have formed in a dense cluster of stars. Uh, not a globular cluster, but a very big, dense, open cluster of stars uh, with a minimum of 10,000 members. And so this is kind of a typical big uh, open cluster of stars where you see a lot of newborn stars, a lot of gas and dust. And then as the gas and dust uh, gets uh, consumed in star formation, you eventually wind up with something like this uh, where you've got thousands of stars uh, that have just formed. And many of these stars will be supergiant stars, which will go supernova. We now recognize that to explain the periodic, the elements we see in the periodic table and their abundances, our solar system must have formed adjacent to four different kinds of supernova eruptions. There are different kinds. Also must have formed relatively close to a hypernova event and also close to at least one, if not two, uh, neutron star merging events. And in each case, you've got enormous fine-tuning in the sense that if your planetary system forms too close to a supernova, the supernova will destroy it. If it's too far away, it won't be sufficiently enriched. And that must be true for all four different kinds of supernova. It must be true for the hypernova, and it must be true uh, for the neutron star uh, merging event. And if that can only happen uh, you, only, you won't get a statistical probability of that happening unless our solar system forms in an open star cluster with a minimum of 10,000 stars. And we recognize that uh, it also has to form in a particular location within our Milky Way galaxy. So this is here uh, shows you uh, where you get the greatest production of heavy elements uh, in our galaxy relative to the distance from the center of our galaxy. So the center of the galaxy, even though it's got the densest, uh, uh, it has the greatest density of stars, it's not the place where you get the greatest density of uh, heavy uh, elements. It happens about four kiloparsecs uh, out from the center of the galaxy. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, one kiloparsec equals 3.26 thousand light years. So if you want to convert it to light years, multiply everything by 3.26. But we now recognize uh, that our uh, solar system must have formed in that location of the universe where you got the peak production of heavy elements. But if it stayed there, uh, then there would be no life. The density of stars there, the radiation that exists there, uh, would have been hostile uh, for life. Stars would be too jammed, uh, jammed too closely together. That would disturb the planetary orbits. You got supergiant stars there that would be radiating deadly radiation. Maybe not deadly for bacteria, but certainly deadly for plants and animals. And so astronomers are now convinced that what happened in the early history of the solar system is that it was gravitationally disturbed by nearby big stars and got ejected from its birth cluster and sent outward into uh, our galaxy. Uh, but again, when it reached that minimum point there, 
at eight kiloparsecs from the center of the galaxy. It had another encounter with big stars that stopped its outward migration. And so we were born at the most dangerous place for life in the universe, but the only place in the universe where we would get an adequate enrichment of these heavy uh, elements. And then we wound up uh, landing in the safest part of the universe uh, where the density of stars is low and uh, where the radiation risk is the lowest. And so to give you an idea, uh, this is what it would look like. Uh, that's where the sun was. And then this is where the sun is now. Uh, a place where the star density is low enough uh, not to be hostile to life and where the radiation is low enough not to be hostile to advanced life. But as you can see, it's just inside that red annulus. That red annulus is what we astronomers refer to as the co-rotation distance. It's the distance from the center of the galaxy uh, where the spiral arm structure, which is rigid, rotates at the same rate that a star would revolve around the center of the galaxy. Stars obey Newtonian mechanics, which means the farther the way they are from the center of the galaxy, the longer it takes for them to revolve around the center of the galaxy. Uh, the spiral arm structure rotates at a rate of about uh, once, uh, makes one uh, complete turn every quarter billion years. And our star, the sun, being just inside the co-rotation distance, likewise takes about a quarter of a billion years to go around the center of the galaxy. This is crucial for advanced life, and that's the one place uh, where you can stay between spiral arms. Right now, we're halfway between the Sagittarius and Perseus spiral arms. Sagittarius is the inside arm. Perseus is the outside arm uh, relative to us. And if you're anywhere uh, besides being close to the co-rotation distance, you'd be crossing those spiral arms at least once every 100 million years. And every time you cross, you're going to be exposed to deadly radiation and gravitational disturbances from giant stars and giant molecular clouds. And I see that I'm uh, up to my time limit here of 30 minutes. So what I'm going to stop here and just make the point is you don't want to be exactly at the co-rotation distance. If you're exactly at the co-rotation distance, uh, your planetary system will suffer uh, from uh, mean motion resonances. I won't go into the technical details, but what that would mean is you'd be sharply kicked towards the center of the galaxy or sharply kicked towards the outer part of the galaxy. You'd no longer be in the safe zone. Uh, but you are safe. You can get away from the mean motion resonances and still cross spiral arms only once every billion years if you're on the inside part, just a little bit inside of the co-rotation distance close enough that you avoid the mean motion resonances, or far enough away that you avoid the mean motion resonances, but close enough that you have only a spiral arm crossing about once every billion years. What I'm going to do, I'll make this a three-week series. Uh, when I come back next Sunday, we're actually going to look at all the different elements, what their abundances are, what that means for life. But the bottom line is, we're probably living on the only planet in the entirety of the universe. Yes, the universe has roughly a trillion, trillion planets, uh, but because of uh, this unique uh, birthing and history feature of our solar system, we wind up uh, with the elements in the periodic table, each one at just the right level for advanced life. I mean, you might be able to explain one or two being at just the right level, what we discover is virtually all of them are at a just right level and anomalous. This is what's really striking my peers. We look at the abundances of these 92 elements. Almost every one of them is anomalous relative to the rest of the universe, and not anomalous by a little bit, sometimes by factors of tens, dozens, even hundreds. I'll cover that uh, next week. And uh, Mark, I'd love for you to give your perspective. <coughs> 
So if you could come up here and uh, tell us what you thought about this past weekend. Yeah, well, thank you, Hugh. Now, the first thing that I would I'd mention to everyone is that every person who, every one of the scholars who was participating in that conference or the workshop was the same caliber as Hugh. So each one would, comes from a different discipline, but you're not talking about any slouches. You're you talking need to about put some, the microphone a little closer. Uh, there you go. Thank you. So they're they're very very accomplished people, people who know what they're talking about, scholars of various disciplines. So that was the first thing that struck me. It's it's one of those things where I would say, when this gets to YouTube, don't miss it, because it really is that good. And some of them are have different interests and would you know pique your interest in different ways. So um, when I'm looking at it, I'm looking at it from a perspective of how do we apply this in a in a method that would be useful for evangelism. And certainly all of the scholars that were up here were interested in the very same thing. So some of the things I'm also interested in is how, what, how does philosophy of science fit into this? And it fit in quite nicely. Much of the philosophy of science was discussed here. So let me go over some of the notes that I have here. One of the, one of the important things that I got out of the conference was that uh, we need to continue to find concordism models, ways of testing them. In other words, how much of the Bible can we use and say, well, science is here, science has something to talk to about it, or it's describing something scientific, and how much of it isn't? And what models do we use to determine that? So that subject came up, and I thought, that's very interesting. It's, it's at once a biblically hermeneutic as well as a, it's a scientific question. So they got into that, and I can see why people would want more than just uh, 98,000 words, because you get into that, I could see another 100,000 words just in that question alone. There's a lot of, a lot of implications there. The next one is that the, this was universal. All of the scholars agreed on this, uh, which is hard to find. You get scholars there, they're very nice with each other, but they have some disagreements. But there was one thing they did not disagree on, and that was that the RTB testable creation model was universally seen as unique and powerful. And part of it was that it, it presents an intellectual integrity, and that is particularly the case because RTB is willing to change it. So when there are features that don't correspond to the latest scientific discoveries that are worthy of making alterations to the model, they make the change. That's what science does. That's what RTB's test, testable creation model does. And that makes it easier for us to be able to be honest with people and say, here is how that second book of Revelation, the, the, the nature itself, can be seen as useful in getting the word out that what the Bible teaches about nature and we see through science can be actually tested. <coughs> the third thing was that um, whether someone sees the Bible and nature as two revelations from God can be affected by their view of scientists. And that that is not, that varies very dramatically. So was, I found it interesting that there were actually two very disparate views of that. So one view that one of the scholars talked about was that some people in the society see scientists as, the, as a priesthood. They have this exalted status, they can't be wrong, et cetera. And then there was another position that said, well, there's a crisis in credibility among the scientific community, that some of the popular culture view scientists as not credible, that they have political positions, that they're uh, coming up with things that are racist, that are all sorts of different kinds of things, that, that there is a credibility problem in, from the popular culture, their, their attitude towards scientists. That was two very, very different views of it. And what I saw in that is an opportunity for much more exploration. Uh, why is it that we see these two very divergent views? Why do some people see the science, scientists as the, the priests of our society, the, the gatekeepers of truth? And others say, no, they're not the gatekeepers of truth. As a matter of fact, they don't know anything. And the things that they say they know, they only know a little bit of. Why? Why is, why is that? I think that's, that's worthy of much more exploration, and I think that that's one of the things that the, that the conference did for me that opened up a door to say, you know, there's a lot more to be looked at here. And I look forward to 
the comments by the, the rest of the people who are on that panel, uh, I think there's going to be much more developed from that. And it will help us, all of us in this room and the people who are watching this, understand how we're going to go about the, this project of letting people see that God does reveal himself through creation and that science properly interpreted, scientific methods and, and all of the rigor that's applied to that is useful in bringing people to Christ. So in that respect, complete success. Thank you. Thank you for letting me sure. give a little bit of insights into that. And the one new thing that's going to happen with this uh, workshop is that all the scholars that have participated are going to be writing uh, a paper. We've never done that before, and it was interesting talking to them mm -hmm. yesterday saying, I said, well, you know, you guys have asked us to write a 3,000-word uh, paper from our specialty uh, to complement the book you're bringing out. So the idea is that the book will come out, but it'll be accompanied by these articles uh, from these scholars that were part of the review process. Uh, but it was, I was talking and said, you know what, you said 3,000 words. Can I have 12,000? <laughs> Since this is just so exciting, I said, yeah, I think we can let you have 12,000. We just didn't want to put them through too much work. So uh, I think that's going to be a really valuable addition uh, to have uh, those accompanying uh, papers uh, from the scholars there. Well, with that, we're going to spend the rest of the time uh, taking your questions. And what we're going to do is we'll alternate from a question from people that are part of the live audience and a question from people that are participating uh, through YouTube Live. So anyone got a question here? Yes. Um, now, wait for the microphone. And by the way, you can pose a question to me or to Mark. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, I'd like to ask you about... Uh, can we get the sound? I don't think we got adequate sound on that. Is it on? Is it on? Use this one. Use this one. This one's on. Hello. There we go. Um, recent uh, thoughts of yours regarding Grand TAC? I'll okay, right the Grand TAC model... You're going to see the Grand TAC model uh, develop in depth in the new book, Design to the Core. There's two chapters in the book that deal with the Grand TAC model. And for the rest of you that may not know what uh, he's talking about, the Grand TAC model is a model of the solar system uh, developed by a team of researchers in Nice, France. It's called the Nice model. And uh, what they've been working on it for two decades. And it's a recognition that typically what happens when a planetary system forms is that the big planets, the gas giant planets, the Neptune planets, migrate inward. And when they migrate inward, it disturbs the orbits of the small rocky planets. And in most of these planetary systems we have found out beyond planet, uh, our solar system, reveal a huge population of gas giants and Neptune-sized planets that are actually orbiting interior to the orbit of the Earth. So that's evidence that they migrated inwards because they can only form far away from the stars. And we now know they migrate inwards because there's a gravitational interaction between the new forming gas giant planet and the remaining gas dust and planetismals that remain in the planetary system. So it causes them to move inward. Now that explains about 80% of the planetary systems that we observe beyond planet Earth. The other 20%, we see no migration at all. Or we might see a little bit of outward migration. And that's explained by the fact that these gas giant planets, when they form, they consume virtually all the remaining gas dust and planetismals in their vicinity so they don't migrate. The Grand Tack model is a recognition that the exception is our solar system. The only planetary system we observe is ours whereby you get what they call a Grand Tack. That's a sailing term, which means you can change the directions of your sailing ship even though the wind velocity is in the same uh, direction. And uh, 
It's because we see that the gas giant planets in the solar system have migrated towards the sun, stopped, reversed direction, and migrated outwards. But it's that grand tech model that explains why Mars is as small as it is. Uh, because without that grand tack, uh, you're going to have the rocky planets become more and more massive as you go away from the host star. It's easily explained because there's less heat. Where you've got less heat, you've got a higher probability of the light material uh, coalescing to make the planet. But in our planetary system, Earth is the biggest, not Mars. Mars is only one-ninth the mass of the Earth. I won't go into the details, but that's a crucial feature for life. Uh, but it took 20 years uh, for the NICE team to actually figure out how this grand tack explains not only the small, what they call it the tiny Mars problem, why Mars is so tiny, and why uh, there is no uh, inner asteroid belt. Because without that grand tack, what you call the asteroid belt, the belt that's between Mars and uh, Jupiter, it would be much, much larger, and there'd be a lot of comets and asteroids orbiting close to the orbit of Mars, when in fact there's virtually none. Uh, the main belt of asteroids uh, tends to be between halfway between Mars and Jupiter, all the way out to uh, Jupiter. So. All that's going to be in the book Design to the Core, lots of diagrams there. Uh, but I also will show you in the book uh, the rocky planets we see orbiting other planetary systems and the rocky planets in our solar system. And ours is the only one where you got rocky planets uh, orbiting uh, beyond the orbit of Mercury and the only one where they're big and they're very dense. And the Grand Tack model explains part of that, but only part of that. The other part is explained by what happened with the sun. You know what? This is all stuff that I think would make a great lecture series. So I, I thought I probably ought to stop. You can look at the book, and I think this would be a good thing to actually uh, make into a couple of talks. But the bottom line is extraordinary fine tuning. So we have a question from the online audience? We do. Uh, Mark Wilburn says, uh, Dr. Ross, will you comment on Dr. Michael Heiser's assertion that he used an astronomy program to plot the astronomical vision of Revelation 12? Yeah, I'm actually dealing with Michael Heiser in the new book because uh, uh, Michael Heiser, uh, he's calls himself evangelical, conservative, Hebrew scholar, very well trained, uh, but he has now joined the camp of conservative theologians who adopt what's called an accommodationist view. Uh, accommodationism <coughs> is this doctrine. This is what was discussed uh, this uh, yesterday and on Friday. It's the doctrine that's being promoted in conservative evangelical circles today uh, that the Holy Spirit partners with the human authors and doesn't try to correct their mistaken scientific and historical ideas. And so they say there are errors in the Bible, but it's not errors from the Holy Spirit. It's the fact that the Holy Spirit is accommodating the mistaken uh, beliefs of the human authors. Uh, and they say we believe in biblical inerrancy, but we believe that what the Holy Spirit inspires uh, is inerrant, but not what is accommodated. Uh, and our critique uh, during this conference is uh, that actually sets up a theological priesthood. You know, Mark told you about the scientific priesthood, uh, where you got these priests that know everything and have to tell lay people how to think. Well, likewise, you've got the problem that if you're really going to take that position, you're going to need these experts to tell you what parts of the Bible you can trust and what parts you can't trust. And, uh, you know, from my perspective, they're basically trying to accommodate naturalistic evolution. Uh, that's what I see going on 
and all of these theological studies and these books that are coming out. Michael Heiser uh, is in that camp. He's a recent addition to that camp, uh, but he's also very much into end times prophecy, and uh, he's also into angiology. I've been on the platform with him speaking at a couple of occasions, and uh, like him, I believe in angels. And like him, I believe that there's validity to end times prophecy, much of which should be taken literally. Where we differ is that Michael tends to take these angiology in rather speculative directions, at least in my opinion. He speculates that there's this complex hierarchy of angels. And I do agree that the Bible does talk about uh, archangels and angels but I don't see any layered uh, hierarchy like he does, nor do I think the angels are part of a divine council that gives counsel to God. I think God is strictly alone uh, in creation, as it says in the book of Isaiah. But likewise, Michael speculates about end times prophecy. This thing about uh, you know these astronomical observations is in that category. He's not alone. Uh, you know, I've written articles at reasons.org about people who think that lunar eclipses are signs that we're heading into the end times and basically saying lunar eclipses are really common. And yes, uh, there are prophecies in the Bible about the moon turning red in color, but it also says it happens at the same time the sun turns red in color and the reds turn red, the stars turn red in color. So I don't think it's got anything to do with lunar eclipses. So likewise, I'm skeptical of this new claim by Michael Heiser. Question? Got a question from the audience here? If not, we'll take another question okay. from the uh, virtual audience. Um, here's one from Craig McMahon. Uh, if the mass of the universe determines the number and type of elements, what would happen if there were more dark matter and less ordinary, or vice versa? Well, that's something that we astronomers are still working on, is trying to measure in a precise manner the ratio of dark matter to ordinary matter. Uh, our measurements tell us roughly there's five to six times as much dark matter as there is ordinary matter. Um, the dark matter doesn't play a role uh, in the formation of elements. The elements in the periodic table, they're 100% ordinary matter. So you're not going to get any of those elements from the dark matter. But the dark matter plays a role in that it determines the structure of galaxies and galaxy clusters in the universe. And the one thing you'll see in the book Design to the Core is that our Milky Way galaxy has a unique dark matter halo a dark matter halo like we see in no other uh, spiral galaxy. Uh, it's typically uh, with a spiral galaxy, it's half ordinary matter and half exotic matter. Some of them have twice as much exotic matter as ordinary matter. With our Milky Way galaxy, it's nine to 10 times as much dark matter as ordinary matter. And <coughs> What's amazing is that the dark matter halo that surrounds our Milky Way galaxy, it's <coughs> kind of like a flattened uh, oblate uh, spheroid, but it extends halfway to the Andromeda <coughs> galaxy. So when you look at the, uh, the stellar disk, it measures about 120,000 light years in total extent, uh, but the dark matter halo uh, measures 2 million light years, actually more than that about 2.4 million light years in extent. As for that reason, we have this incredibly stable spiral arm structure. All that dark matter, it plays a role in stabilizing it, and that will determine uh, what the population you're gonna get of uh, hypernova, nova, and neutron star merging events. You don't want those events to be too numerous, but you do want them to be numerous enough. So that's where dark matter plays a role. Okay. <clears throat> yes. The gap theory, the Cambrian explosion, 
Would you talk about that and how it fits, it coincides with the fine-tuned universe? And what was your first statement? <laughs> The gap theory. Oh, the gap theory. And the Cambrian explosion and how that coincides with a fine-tuned universe. Yeah, well, let me see if I understand you about the gap theory. Uh, the gap theory uh, is, is a theological construct, basically saying uh, that the days of creation are six consecutive 24-hour periods, but there's a gap between Genesis 1-1 when God creates the universe and the beginning of creation day one. And therefore, you can throw in billions of years there. And the gap theorists are correct that the grammatical structure, in fact, one of the expert theologians we had here yesterday uh, was Jack Collins, C. John Collins. And in my opinion, he's written the best material demonstrating that when you do a detailed study of the placement, the word order, and the grammar of Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2, it establishes a component of the gap theory which says that there uh, is an undetermined passage of time between Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2, and another undetermined passage of time between Genesis 1, 2 and Genesis 1, 3. And as I've shared with some of my young earth creationist friends, you can still have the universe billions of years old uh, even if you believe that the days are 24-hour periods because of the way Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2 are structured. Uh, but most gap theories are this idea that God created the universe and the earth, and uh, then everything got ruined, uh, mainly because there was this dialogue between God and Satan, kind of like what you see in the book of Job, and God says, hey, uh, you're think, you think you're my equal? Give it a go. And so Satan gives it a go, really messes it all up, and God comes in and fixes everything. And the fixing of everything is the six days of creation. So that's the gap theory. Uh, but the gap theory is held by very few people today uh, because it was based on the idea that when you look at the original Hebrew manuscripts, we're going to find copies uh, that translate uh, Genesis 1 2, that the world became formless and void, rather than how we see it in most English translations, the world was formless and void. The crucial Hebrew verb there is the verb hayah, translated to be or was. Um, and to translate it as the world became formless and void, you would have to find a manuscript that has haya with la, haya la. And there was speculation that we would find manuscripts that would have that uh, Hebrew wording. Well, 50 years later, we've yet to find a single Hebrew manuscript that says haya la. They all say haya. So for exegetical reasons alone, the gap theory has been thrown out. But yeah, you'll still see it in your Schofield Bible. You'll still see it in uh, you know, older uh, theological texts. But the latest texts are basically saying, uh, and I can't name for you a single theologian today who holds to the gap theory. Uh, there's a recognition. It fails in exegetical grounds alone. And uh, your second question? The Cambrian explosion. Cambrian explosion. Right, I actually talked about the Cameron explosion during the 30-minute talk I got to give uh, yesterday, yesterday morning. That's recorded. You'll be able to see it. We've talked about the Cameron explosion here in the Paradoxes class several months ago. Uh, there's probably the uh, most extensive thing you'll see is in the book Improbable Planet. I don't have very much at all on Improbable uh, in, on the uh, Cameron explosion uh, in uh, the new book, Design to the Core. It will be uh, in the book on dual revelation. And I give an update in dual revelation of what was not in Improbable Planet. Um, the update to Improbable Planet is we now have a later date for the Cameron explosion. In Improbable Planet, I gave the date 543 million years ago. 
and the error bar was plus or minus four million years. What you're going to see in the dual revelation book is we now have a date of 538 million years ago, and the error bar is a plus or minus uh, you know, 225,000 years. So we now have a really accurate date. And what's also new is that there was speculation, well, most of the Cambrian explosion phyla show up at the beginning of the Cambrian explosion, uh, but there are three that come later. Well, the latest update is the one that they thought came the latest, the Bryozoa phylum, uh, which they thought came 60 million years later. They've now discovered fossils that place it right at the beginning of the Cambrian explosion. So there's still two more that need to be identified, but the fact that the most difficult one to detect, the Bryozoa, has now been positively identified in two different locations, Australia and in South China. Both places they have found fossil parts of the Bryozoa that date to the very beginning of the Cameron explosion, which is causing paleontologists to recognize all the phyla we see on planet Earth today were present at the beginning of the Cameron explosion. They think it's just a matter of time before we find the other two. And incidentally, it wasn't surprising to me that they couldn't see the bryozoa until recently. Uh, these are animals uh, that are less than a millimeter across. The average body size is two-tenths of a millimeter to seven-tenths of a millimeter. You know, a millimeter is that small. So uh, finding a fossil that tiny isn't easy. Uh, but they pulled it off. So. Uh, Basically, the latest scientific discoveries are telling us the Cameron explosion is even more explosive uh, than we thought. And what I was sharing with the theologians yesterday is that the leading paleontologists, experts on the Cameron explosion, uh, namely Valentine and Irwin, are saying this is the opposite of what we would predict from a naturalistic perspective. Naturalistic uh, biological evolutionary models predict that you're going to have a proliferation of species generated by mutations, natural selection, gene exchange, and epigenetics that if you wait long enough will produce new genera. And if you wait much longer, it'll produce new families, then new orders, new classes, and last of all, new phyla. But we see at the Cameron explosion and also the Avalon explosion, it's the opposite. The phyla show up first the proliferation of species happens last. Moreover, the phyla show up all at once, and they show up immediately when the oxygen permits their existence. So this is powerful new evidence uh, that it's the hand of the creator god of the Bible that brought about the Cameron explosion and brought it about at just the right time to make possible the entry of humans uh, in the narrow time window when the sun permits uh, the luminosity stability to enable us not only to exist but develop global civilization. You'll see uh, the <coughs> latter part in the book Designed to the Core. Okay. How, how many more questions can you handle? You? Okay, we'll take, uh, it's already 2.43, uh, so uh, we'll take one more. Okay. Uh, someone with a number, 9,164,000 as their name. Uh, are there an approximate dates for the ejection of the solar system and when the solar system settled on its current position? We have an approximate date, not an accurate date. The approximate date is that it happened within the first few million years of the formation of the sun and its nascent planets. Uh, we can't do any better than that, although most astronomers believe it happened probably less than a few million years ago, but likely less than a million years ago, maybe even less than 100,000 years. Uh, no, not a million years ago, pardon me. From the very first time when the sun forms out of its gas cloud, probably within the first 100,000 years, you get the ejection. Uh, and certainly no later than a few million years, but most likely less than a million years. So that would be four point. Five billion years ago? Yeah, 4.5 billion years okay. ago. 
right. 4.566 billion years ago. Yeah. All right, well, that was the last question. Can you want to close in prayer? Now? I'll close this in prayer. Okay. Well, Father in heaven, I'm just grateful, first of all, for uh, these eminent scholars that came to join us uh, yesterday and Friday and really help us uh, build a new component of our testable creation model here at Reasons to Believe. And Father, I pray that you would uh, give them the wisdom, the grace, uh, the uh, memory, uh, the intellect to be able to write the papers. Thank you, Father, that they're so excited uh, with such a positive attitude about writing these papers. And Father, I pray that uh, you would encourage all of us as we go away today that we'd be sensitive to opportunities when we get to share what we have learned with other people and encourage them uh, to develop a relationship with Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.